So I don't think anyone needs a primer on The Sims at this point, right? If you're watching this, chances are you've dabbled with at least one of the mainline games, but did you ever play the weird console ports? Calling them ports even is somewhat misleading, outside of the first game that is. The main thing that separated the console versions from the original games was the implementation of a story mode. Basically, you know how The Sims is historically about doing whatever you want to do with no set objective? The console versions buck this trend and give you predetermined goals to work towards in order to progress some story. The gameplay was the exact same as it always was, but if you could find the time in between caring for your Sims' basic needs, you could complete some boring tasks to further a flimsy narrative. Don't get me wrong, I'm not about to dissect the plot of a Sims game. For what it's worth, these little stories are fun for what they are. They're quaint, but charming. Back in like 2008-ish, I think, a friend introduced me to The Sims 2 on the PlayStation 2, and I was instantly hooked. I was only 8, and the most experience I'd had with games to this point was pulling sweet motorcycle tricks in Vice City, or pulling sweet motorcycle tricks in MX vs ATV Off-Road Fury. So playing a game in which you just live life normally was utterly fascinating to me. It wasn't until later when I played the mainline games in the series that I realized just how weird the PS2 games were. Hell, this isn't even the weirdest one. Remember Herb's Sims in the City? I recently installed PCSX2 onto my computer and wanted to see if the game was as good as I remembered. Side note, trying to find a ROM or BIOS or whatever the fuck that wasn't just malware was a nightmare. Your casual gamer on YouTube made the process infinitely easier than it would have been otherwise. So thank you, sir. Because of you, my computer gets to live to see a new day. So you start the game up and watch the intro video. It sets a great tone and shows you all the new areas you'll explore and characters you'll get to meet. It's fun. Then you head into the story mode and create your sim. There's not a ton to speak on here, the sim creation tools are pretty rudimentary. Something notable though is layers. Your sim can wear an undershirt, overshirt, and some kind of jacket or hoodie over top it all. This is pretty neat. The Sims 3 and 4 don't even have this level of customization. Anyway, you pick your aspiration, set your special stats, name your sim, and then you're sent to your first lot. What you'll notice immediately is that The Sims now handles like Grand Theft Auto. For some reason, Maxis decided to change the game's controls to third person. Again, these games were really weird, and you can only imagine how it felt when I discovered that basically no other sim game plays like this. If you've never played this before, it can be pretty jarring, but it does actually streamline some interactions. For example, say you want to take out the trash. All you have to do is stand near the trash, select it, pick it up, walk it to the can, and throw it out. It also allows the sims to be less robotic. If you walk near something smelly, your sim will react. If they walk by somebody they know, they'll turn their heads to look at them. If music's playing nearby, your sim will snap their fingers to it. It's actually pretty cool. Your roommates to start are Mr. and Mrs. 2005, and your goals are pretty simple. Jump on the trampoline, take a shower, talk to your roommates, etc. After you complete these goals, the game allows you to move on to your next lot. This is the structure of the game. You have to complete your own, and sometimes other sims, gold wants in order to unlock the next lot, in order to complete more wants, in order to unlock the next lot. You get the idea. By this point in playing, you'll likely have noticed how insane the interactions are with other sims. To impress somebody, a sim will balance a vacuum cleaner on their nose. You can give somebody the finger, slap a sim with a fish, play hacky sack, perform a card trick with a surprising amount of success, and more. It's deranged, but really fun. By far, this is also the most sexually explicit sim game, I think, with interactions like this. Settle a shoot. Oh, mesh, mesh, mesh. <laughs> anyway, you make it to your next lot and are forced to get a job and become enemies with this guy, Torin. Seriously, one of your goals, for some reason, is to become enemies with him. The game has a lot of out there objectives like this, and it can be really fun to achieve them sometimes. To become an enemy with someone, you have to get your relationship meter with them below negative 10 points. All the other sim games have relationship meters too, but it's helpful seeing it in real time like this. Socialization is pretty much a minigame this time around. Increasing your relationship with somebody is much more of an event, it feels like. The problem is that your success is largely based on chance. Yes, you have an infinite number of attempts to get a sim to like you, but they react negatively to the most random things. It's not a huge problem now, but it will be later. So you fish slap Torn a few times and complete some more wants and goals over the next couple of days. Your final goal for this lot is to beat Torn at foosball, which I do decisively. On to our next lot, Cliffside Retreat. Isabella here is struggling with her bed and breakfast, and it's up to you to help her. Why our sim is randomly traveling from place to place and helping random sims in need, I have no clue. Anyway, after your wants are met, you have to take control of Isabella and help her. Most of the work here is pretty easy and easily ignorable, so let's move on to our next lot. The HMS Amore is where the major cracks start to form in the game structure. There are three sims living on this lot besides you, and only two of them are controllable. The controllable ones, of course, have wants that need to be met. Kind of. If you complete Hector's wants, you unlock a whole new area to explore with new problems. It's all totally optional though, and the game never tells you this. It quickly becomes overwhelming having to look over this many sims with this many wants and needs. 
Dishes quickly piled up since the AI never cleans them. Toilets, showers, stoves, and sinks broke due to overuse and it takes a while to fix them. Your sim's needs are only ever barely met to satisfaction. I'm getting ahead of myself a little, but the game will quickly get to be too much most of the time and it never lets up. I played Spiritfarer recently and this reminded me of that. In Spiritfarer, you have to look after a houseboat full of characters and keep an eye on their every whim and desire. I love that game's art style, music, and writing, but I could tell early on that the gameplay was going to become a massive chore for me, so I tapped out. I didn't have that luxury with The Sims 2 though, since I was already committed to making a video on it. On this boat, we have Betty, Nelson, and Hector. Betty may live on the water, but she belongs to the streets. She wants to marry Nelson, just so that she can cheat on him with Hector. Hector wants to fuck anything with legs, basically. Betty's wants mostly revolve around wooing Nelson, though there are a couple of wrenches thrown in to make it interesting. For example, one of her wants is to make a meal with the aphrodisiac effect. This highlights the cooking system, which is surprisingly extensive. There are a ton of ingredients to combine to make a plethora of meals. The game is really innovative in super bizarre ways. No sim game after this features this cooking system, and it's kind of a shame, honestly. The problem with this scenario in particular is that the game gives no indication on how to prepare a meal with the aphrodisiac effect. Thank God for the Sims Wiki in this instance, and many more to come. Getting back on track though, the HMS Amore was a fucking nightmare. I chose a political career for my Sim because it was the first job that popped up. In order to be promoted, which you have to do in order to advance the game, your charisma skill needs to be at a certain level. This equates to in-game hours and real-life minutes upon minutes of speaking into a mirror while the rest of the world descends into chaos around you. Let me paint a picture of the typical day aboard the HMS Amore. My sim wakes up in the early hours of the morning, needing to eat breakfast before he heads off to work, because he's the only one with a job. During the night and throughout the day, I would work Betty and Hector towards their wants. While I was controlling one, the other was usually off making food or relaxing in one of the love tubs. After making and eating a meal, they'd throw the dirty dish on the floor, instead of throwing it away or using one of the three sinks in the house. They would then use the toilet and not flush. Then they'd turn on the TV and never turn it off. I would take a very brief break from honing Betty's skills to put Hector to bed. No more than three seconds would pass and I would resume control over Betty, only to find her slipping into a hot tub, having immediately abandoned whatever I was having her do before as soon as I went to control Hector. Couple this with neighbors constantly ringing the doorbell, being invited in and making even more of a mess, and the constant need to look after three sims needs, and we have a recipe for disaster. While my sim was getting his Sigma male grind set on, Betty, Hector, Nelson, and all the neighbors were constantly making the house a disaster. It's maddening, and it gets worse. Betty eventually got caught in a fire and died. No, this didn't stifle my progress. If anything, I became more productive. Death doesn't work here how it does in the main games. If you die in this, you just wander around as a ghost, unable to do anything besides bother living sims. As soon as you die, the Grim Reaper appears on your lot and won't leave until you ask him for your life back. While not in the player's control, ghost sims are a huge nuisance. Their only way to interact with anybody is to harass them. While Betty was dead, I focused on my sim and his wants. For, no joke, days, Betty tormented Hector until he passed out from exhaustion. More than a few times. I'm surprised he didn't die from starvation, because I sure wasn't taking care of his needs. Since he'd be locked in interacting with her, his needs fell constantly. Midway through my stay on this vessel, I started to cheat. I used cheats to bump my needs up and max out my skills. If I didn't, this video would never have been made. Bear in mind that days go by quickly in-game. After a while, increasing your skill in something takes an excruciating amount of time. Time that I didn't have, since the average human lifespan is only 72 years, and weekends don't exist in this game. I'd like to say that everything was smooth sailing after leaving the Amore, but it wasn't. Next stop on the map is Sunset Canyon, which isn't a canyon at all, actually. It's an Old West movie set. We gotta help Red here with some of the most random things imaginable. I get the distinct impression that the dev team was running out of relevant goals to give to The Sims, so they eventually started randomizing them. Red is an aspiring filmmaker and wants to resurrect Helga so they can be wed. There are three Sims on this lot besides Red, and they're all ghosts. Remember how I said about a paragraph ago that ghosts in this game are a horrible inconvenience? Well, imagine three of the fuckers tormenting Red for all eternity. That was essentially his life before my sim arrived. Thank goodness I was cheating by this point because all his needs were basically at zero and it was going to be a huge pain maintaining them by normal means. The saving grace for Sunset Canyon is the costume chest. The first thing I did upon arriving in Sunset Canyon was put on an anatomically impossible robot suit and start metal detecting. Sometimes the game can really shine. In no other game have I used a metal detector while dressed up as a robot in the middle of an abandoned western movie set. I found a monkey paw of all things. My sim's wands weren't anything noteworthy here, and reds weren't especially difficult, so let's move on. On to our next lot, Tranquility Falls. My first want is to use the massage table. Fair enough. I looked on the lot for one, and there's nothing. No problem, I guess I have to buy it. Mm -hmm. 
Where the fuck is it? Confoundingly, the massage table is under the electronics tab. Why? Because another sim can't massage you. The table has robot arms to do it. It gets more frustrating as the game continues how vague and uninspired the wants become. A lot of my sim's wants here is to just buy something expensive. How dull. I guess I prefer it over grinding more skills, but it's hardly engaging. Chantal here wants to become more creative. I need to max out her creativity skill. I try to outsmart the game by cheating, but unfortunately I can't artificially bump up any sim's skills besides my own. Touché, Maxis. You bastards. Most of my time at Tranquility Falls was spent ogling an easel while Chantal painted portrait after portrait, only ever slightly increasing her creativity skill. Are you starting to see the problem? There's so much potential for fun challenges in this game, but instead it focuses on grinding skills and buying stuff. Anyway, I eventually got Chantal settled and moved on to the next lot. This lot, creatively named Alien Crash Site, is actually pretty dope. We're in Strange Town, and tensions are said to be rising between the aliens and their neighbor, Jonas. He hates aliens, but the aliens want to make amends. If you're wondering why I'm not calling the aliens by their names, it's because it's damn near impossible for me to. From now on, it's boy and girl alien. I want to stop briefly to give the game its due praise on its visual design. Despite not being able to explore the surrounding map, the game has a great sense of place, and it feels really cozy. Maybe that's partly nostalgia speaking on my behalf, but the environments do really feel homely. It also features vistas that would be impossible to replicate in a mainline Sims game. Overall, the game just has a really cartoonish and fun style, but like I said before, each environment also has a great sense of place. From the crashed alien ship, to the hilltops, to the beachfront, and more. It's fun to just hang out in these locations sometimes. The wants here are pretty stupid. The aliens already own two computers, but for some reason my sim really wants to buy another. The girl alien wants a hot tub, despite already owning the best hot tub in the game. What really grinds my gears at this point specifically is my career. To be promoted, my sim has to have and maintain a certain amount of friends. By the later stages of the game, this is torturous. Sims in this are extremely fickle and would declare our friendship dead if I hadn't spoken to them in two in-game days. A few times, multiple sims would end friendships simultaneously. Maintaining these relationships is maybe the most tedious thing I've ever done in a game. I would call sims over at, let's say, 5 p.m. They would either arrive super late and leave shortly after, or they wouldn't show up at all, despite saying that they would. Sure, I could have traveled to multiple lots and met them instead, but that's also very time-consuming. It becomes a nightmare having to do all this with how unreliable these sims are. I needed 10 friends to be promoted. Let's say I have 9. I just need one more. Remember how I said before that your socialization success largely relies on chance? Are you starting to understand my problem? I try to increase my relationship with a sim before work, only to have my guy fuck it all up for no reason. He failed a shocking amount of social interactions for having a charisma skill of 10. Sims react negatively to the most random of things too, decreasing our relationship points and wasting time. It was maddening, and I hope I'm doing a good job illustrating just how frustrating it all was. After hours of trying to get my relationships just right, I was finally promoted. On to our last lot, the Biodome. For my Sims part of the Biodome, I was done with his wants pretty quickly. What really stumped me though, was this man. Mr. Noel Howard. This scumfuck. How Noel doesn't show up as one of gaming's most hated characters, I don't know. By the time the credits rolled on The Sims 2, I hated Noel with every fiber of my being, and then some. I wish I could scan this bastard into the real world to perform unspeakable acts of cruelty upon him. So, remember how difficult it was to maintain relationships with my Sim? I didn't think it could get any worse, but Noel swiftly proved me wrong. To get to the final level of the politics career, Noel's final want, you have to maintain 12 friends. Since Noel already had about 8, I figured it wouldn't be so bad. Noel is just about the most uncharismatic man in the universe, it turns out. Maintaining, or God forbid, making friends with him was the most difficult thing I've ever done in a video game. No joke. I would have had an easier time outrunning a fighter jet than I had making Noel friends. Try to impress somebody? He drops the vacuum cleaner on their head every time. Tell a joke? Bomb. Hacky sack? Somehow he'd fuck that up too. Even the talk interaction. The safest, lowest risk interaction possible, he would lose points on that too. I never failed the talk interaction before this point. I was astounded at how fucking useless this man was. Even if he was already friends with someone, they'd grow to hate him after a brief conversation. Trying to call people over would result in them agreeing to come over and then not coming over. He had maxed out charisma at this point too. Every time you see me pause the game here, it's because I had to fight the desire to rip my own head off. Just trying to get Noel to maintain 12 friends took me 3 straight hours. That doesn't sound like a lot, but holy shit it felt like an eternity. 3 hours of him going to work, coming home, talking to people, 
filling his needs up through cheats, thank Christ, and then repeating the process. If I had to venture a guess on how many in-game days passed during this stretch, I would say that numerous sim civilizations rose and fell while this was all happening. I cannot stress enough how unfun this was. I nearly quit playing before I beat it, but thankfully I won. And I know what you might be thinking. I didn't win, since I wasted hours of my life on this game that I'll never get back. But I disagree, and I think I can call myself the ultimate victor. Eventually, through blood, sweat, and tears, Noel finally got promoted. I don't think I've ever felt so relieved in my life. I completed my Sims' final platinum want and beat The Sims 2. And what was I awarded with? A blooper reel. I shouldn't have to tell you that this was an underwhelming reward for my efforts. Then again, anything less than $10,000 in cash would have felt underwhelming, so that's a moot point. The game doesn't have to end here though, it's still The Sims after all, so what's going on in free play mode? Not much unfortunately. Sims don't age in this, they can't have kids, the build and buy modes are pretty limited, and there's just not much to do. This wasn't really meant to be a review, but if you really want to play this out of nostalgia or just curiosity, then go ahead I guess. I can't recommend it, but it's free with the emulator, so go wild. I was really hoping it would be better, or at least as good as I remembered it. It innovates and does some really cool stuff, like the clothing, cooking, environments, etc., but it's also just a total grindfest of a campaign. There's no real story to follow to speak of, just a checklist of random bullshit to do. The free play mode is also shallow in comparison to any other sim game. All in all, The Sims 2 on the PS2 has a certain whimsy and charm about it, and most certainly feels like a product of its time, but it's also of very little consequence. Very little of what this game does uniquely is revisited later on in the series, which is a shame, I think. Really, it's a total oddball of a game, and that can be both a good and bad thing. If you play, you'll probably have fun, but it won't last very long. <laughs>